And here we go. Okay, this is pod number nine. Good. Oh, it is evening. Good evening. Good evening. And this one is going to be MMA heavy, and we're going to talk about some other combat sports, but we're going to review the card that just happened. There's Cannoneer Gastelum, and then we're going to talk about next week's card. Well, and we're going to do a little backtrack back to Gum Lewis Yeah, first. we're going to go back to a couple weeks in, you know, the, both the UFC and PFL, and we'll go from there. So, first on the rundown, we had, for the PFL playoffs, <clears throat> it was Rory McDonald against Ray, Ray Cooper the third. Yes. And... Rory just looked stiff and not engaged, and Rory Cooper just, it just dismantled him. It just looked like Rory wasn't there, kind of similar to the comments we made after the uh, Glacen fight. He just he just wasn't doing Enough. anything. Enough. I mean, he was on the ground with Ray, and he just had him in guard. He just stayed there. And so that, that was, was it, yeah. I don't know. That's not how you win... The championship, so he's out of the playoffs. And he just didn't look like himself. I don't know if it's him being the more tactical Rory as opposed to emotional fighter. Um, I don't know if it's just him getting older. So, I don't know. What do you think? Do you think it's a little bit of both? Yeah, I think maybe stuff starting to catch up with him. You took it as tactical when I... I guess, like, looking back on it for me, I didn't think it necessarily sounded like he was turning into someone more tactical. It just sounded more detached. Yeah. And I'm just wondering if maybe he's even more detached than I originally thought. Okay, that's fair. So I guess we'll see if he resigns next year, where he goes, if he doesn't go anywhere, if he just quits. So we'll, so we'll see. Or if he just decides he doesn't want to keep fighting professionally. So that'll be something he's got to decide the next, I guess, I don't know when the next season starts, but he's still got the finals and then he's got the off season. So we'll see. And then disappointing run though, for sure. I don't think anybody expected to see these performances out of Rory. And I don't think that the, that's what the PFL signed him for. No, he was supposed to be in the finals and he's not now. So. Heavy favorite to win even. Yeah. So Ray Cooper now will be in the finals and he will be fighting Magomed, Magomed Karamov, mm -hmm. who you said. Oh yeah. He looks like Mo Schrute. But he's... He does, kind of, though. He's very dominant, I guess. I mean, he went out there and took care of business, and now he's in the finals. So we'll see how he does against Ray Cooper. And it's a little boring, but... that's But that's their most exciting division. That is their most exciting division, but... They are, it, that specific fighter, Magomed, Magomed Karamov, is a little bit He just boring. grinds in the I wins. just, honestly, I'm just... He just grinds in the I wins. like Khabib, but I'm not impressed by the Khabib clones. Got you. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> but yeah, so That's we'll see it. how he does in the finals. And I think did he won it two years ago or a year ago. Uh, there he... was none last so year. Two years May, I guess he won it two years ago. I think he beat Ray Cooper in the uh, what's it called? Semis. Yeah. What? Um. So yeah. But that is aside from that division. I'd say the women, Kayla Harrison. She. Went to a decisive ground and pound victory. She'll be moving on to the finals. Uh, is what's her name? Is Clarissa Shields also in her division? Uh, or is it a different division? That hasn't happened. Yeah. Well, yeah, they're in the same. Wait. Okay. Are they in the same? I guess, yeah, I guess they're in the same division. So Clarissa Shields must not have made it through. Or she's got the other semis. I don't know. We'll see. No, I think the final's set. Oh, okay. Well, then we'll look at that. And then. Ray Lewis was in an ATT feature with Kayla Harris, and basically they took the kids' conversation to family and just. It was just nice seeing the yeah. crossover between sports and like two very intense being athletes. able, yeah, being able to identify that intensity. Um, I don't know. I just thought like, obviously Ray Lewis doesn't do the same sport, and he doesn't, you know, they don't really have a concept of what the other one does, but they are able to relate to the motivations yeah. that each other have for doing what they do. And I don't know, it was just like a nice tender sports moment, in my opinion. And that's also ATT is one of the big gyms. And so obviously they have a lot of talent. 
and you get to work with a lot of fighters. So they would possibly garner more attention with athletes to come in and do this kind of stuff. And then we were thinking on the other side of that, someone we were just talking about, Ray Cooper, he still trains in his garage in Hawaii with his, his boys. Yep. His brothers, as he says, and they're just literally, I think some were actually his brothers and some were just. Yeah, I think some of them are his family. And his dad, and, then his some dad other guys. and I guess just people he knows from home. And I, I don't know, I'm really like inspired by that connection to his roots. It's also just like that whole, you know, it works for him. Why would you stop doing something that works? This is the fight preparation that he knows. Obviously, this formula helps him win fights. And, I mean, from a foundational point of MMA, having close relationships and respect for other people is a cornerstone. Yeah. So. Yeah. I'd agree. So that's somebody to keep an eye on in the PFL. And I, I'm not sure when that fight is, but it's probably going to be a good one. And then moving to the UFC, Don Lewis, that was a couple weeks ago. But just Meh. to quickly recap, yeah, it wasn't super exciting. I think it was kind of the predictable outcome. Unfortunately, everyone was hoping for that one moment from Lewis, and it might have happened at one point, but it never obviously it never finished. materialized. And Gone is the interim heavyweight champion. Yeah, and he will be fighting Francis Ngannou at some point, probably in France. UFC is trying to get to Paris. They have already done desperately it with, trying to get to Paris. Say they did it with Mexico and some other countries, so we will see how they want to do that. And we had a week off, which was sad because there, I don't think there's anything on TV that weekend, really. Yeah, there was. It, it was a little bit of a slow weekend. And to be fair, we've been pretty pampered by Dana, who has basically put on a show every weekend. <laughs> so it's not like we have had that many breaks, actually. We've had maybe and a couple And we're not going to have breaks again for a little bit. <clears throat> yeah, so, so they're, they're lined up so for the So there'll be summer. more MMA to discuss. So, yeah, that's that's nice. And like we said, the last weekend just happened. We had a uh, headline by Kelvin Gastelum and Jerry Cannonier. Pre- the whole thing, honestly, looked low-key online. O- which, it looked okay on paper. Which means... And every card that looks okay on paper turns sure. out to be a banger. And this card did not disappoint nope. yet again. We had Ramiz Rahimaj. Uh, he, he submitted Sasha Palatnikov. In the first round, that was impressive. So that was a nice opening to things. So, yeah, I mean, Dana and everybody always likes when the first fight ends with a finish. Yeah. Then we had probably a highlight you'll see for the next decade, if not longer. This man Ignacio Bahamondes. He basically... He was losing the entire fight. Yes. And then he pulled out a move that basically was made famous by Edson Barbosa, who's fighting next weekend. But... That has a highlight that's been played for the last decade, and it's a spinning wheel kick. You should look it up. Edson Barbosa wheel kick, and he absolutely flatlines this man with a spinning kick, and this is basically exactly what he pulled out with how much time left? About a minute and a half, maybe? Yeah, just a little bit. I mean, it was exactly what he needed. He needed a big move. He needed a knockout to win. And the fight, like you said, he'd been losing the first round. He he'd was getting He was up. busted. And then he had taken Roosevelt, a really big elbow uh, to his face right. that cut him over the eye. He was bleeding a lot, so obviously that gets in your vision. It doesn't help your breathing at all. But Roosevelt Roberts started to fade, and he stayed tough. And from what we heard from the commentators, his past fights, he did have, like I think we talked about, you know, tough fights with veterans or tough fights. that He, he definitely lost, but he stayed in there, and he was tough. So he showed his toughness here persevered and pushed through and got the win the in a really stunning fashion and i think it's worth looking up and we'll be seeing that for a Enjoying while that and then yeah. the card continued rolling <laughs> and william knight Flat i don't line. even know how to describe he just mocked, the knockout just but massacred him. he looked huge he's a big boy um he's big for even 205 so i don't know what just he's walking into the cage at. An but... insane amount of power. Yes. He's he's just physical dominance. I mean, he's just – he always seems a lot bigger than his competition. And for someone that size, he's not graceful, but he's in control yeah. of his weight. And I don't know. He knows, just knows how to use what he's got to generate power. And for strong KO, they uh, works pretty well. And then we had <laughs> Bea Malecki fighting – Yosani Nunez. Nunez. And we got our fourth 
finish forced in a, row. a straight finish when Josani is just put Malachi down. I mean, just a huge punch to the face, and the ref had seen enough. That was about it, yeah. She wasn't defending herself, and it was over. And then we had a string of decisions with Brian Kelleher winning over Domingo Pilarde. Don't get me wrong, it was a good fight. Um, but obviously decision for Kelleher there. Austin Lingo took a decision over Luis Saldana. That was a good Those fight. Those weren't bad fights. They were very good fights. They just were just, went to yeah, they just went to the decision. Then we had Alexandra Pantoja um, submit Brandon Royval Brandon in the Royval, second round. A very fun fight. Two um, good, fight. good competitors in that division. Very respectful of each other. They, I don't know if they fought. No, they were asking Pantoja because he's beaten the champion, right. Moreno. I think so. That's going to be a fight coming up. At some well, yeah. Point. Well, we should talk about that though because yeah. that was. In the post-fight interview, um, there was just a ton of respect from Pantoja for Moreno. Um, in I believe, I believe that DC asked, you know, are you going to call up a champion? How do you feel that Brandon Moreno's a champion now when that you beat, beaten him and when twice. you beat when you've beaten him? And Pantoja, in in all respect, said, you know, I'm happy for him because I was part of the process. Yeah, I beat him and I helped him grow, and helping him grow brought him to where he is now and it's yep. so wonderful to see for the sport for him and like i'm looking forward to seeing him again we're gonna do this again and it was just all love between all three fighters it's yeah. an exciting division i'm i'm honestly glad that it didn't die out when Cejudo left even and, though at the time i was like it's probably kind of useless and i feel like i feel the way dc looks like the proud dad it's just oh, yeah. oh man that's good like you know, they went in there and gave a good fight, but then at the end of the day, it's all respect. And, you know, these guys, it's an intimate experience to get in there and do that with somebody. And, you know, it's not something that you come out of without taking something from it and leaving something behind, I think. Yeah, so, at the very least, even if it's not an emotional connection with the fight, you at least come away with... Respect. Not even that. I, I'm just, I'm trying to talk about... You learn something from every person you oh, fight. Oh, yeah, that's whether, it. Whether you win or lose, you learn something about yourself and yeah. your style and your grit. Like, if you're in a war and, you know, you're able to hang, like, let's say it's your first five-round fight and you lose, but you take it all away, yeah. they, you learn something about yourself. You know that your cardio can hang. Right. You know that you can take a beating, and those are good things to know. Yeah. If you get subbed in the first round, yeah, you, you know you have... That. Take your ass back to your jujitsu class and work on that. Yep, you're right. And those are those are important things to know on both sides of the equation. Yep. And I think that Pentoja was absolutely right. You can't get better without the people that you face, and your opponents are crucial to your development. Yeah. That's just that. I think I agree. Then we had Austin Hubbard fighting Vince Pichel. Another great fight that, that was went really to decision. Good. Um, Austin Hubbard, a lot, a lot of heart in that fight. It's tough. It was, it was honestly, Hubbard, Hubbard was losing overall and he took some big shots, but he never stopped coming forward and he was in it. He could have won that fight several yeah. times, just, you know, just because he was losing on the cards doesn't mean that it was so one-sided. He had chances and he did, you know, Pichelle was just better the yeah, other night. That was his night. It was just better. He was a little, he was a little bit sharper, a little bit quicker. Hitting a little bit harder. I think his cardio um, stood up a little bit better. Stood up a little bit better, but Hubbard is still, yeah, he's on Chomp. He's still on watch, I think. Yep. So he's on a three fight win streak. And Pichel and called out Gregor Gillespie, which it seems like a lot of people are itching to get a piece of. Because I think Gillespie beat him, and so he wants to have him back. Yeah. Okay. He wants to run it back. Some, but somebody else also called out Gillespie. So I'm interested to see what Gillespie does next because, as you know, his last two fights, I mean, Two fights ago, he got flatlined by Kevin Lee, that and then he tough. came back strong after that. So I'm sure he wants to keep his momentum going. He wants his name to be relevant again. He wants to be. Yeah. He wants to be active. So he yeah. wants he wants to move on from that knockout. And just build understandably up back to a title so because he he was on a trajectory for a title shot. Exactly. And so, so I think and I mean I think again. these guys, there's some clear tiers in that division, but we'll see. And then next we had Trevin Jones and Saeed Yakub Kramonov, and that was a good fight. 
That was a good fight. It yeah, submission. A... That was it. Was a grind, I think, honestly, for Sayed Yakub to get there. Yeah, but he he but locked he... down some great. Some, he basically snapped down. Yeah. City, just get the submission. I think that a great fight. Eighteen and a great. Uh, Doors. I think that fight was one of those fights that's a good um it's a good example of patience in a fight. Yep. Because you if pace you yourself. Yeah, you've got to pace yourself and you know, you have a plan and sometimes you have to wait for the right moment to use it. And I think what happens sometimes, especially in those three round fights, is you see fighters kind of trying to rush through their plan and making mistakes. Like, especially once it's, like, halfway through the second round, they're like, oh, my God, half the fight is gone. Like, I really got to start pressing. I feel like, you know, I feel like Sayed Yacoub really waited for the right moment, like you're saying, to go for sub attempts that actually had a chance of working. And I like seeing that. Yep. And he got the win. He did. He did get the win. And that was very impressive. So, I'm looking out for him again. I love the submission game. So, that's always something that I like to watch when – there's somebody on the card that has the capability to just pull out something like that. Then we had Parker Porter and Chase Sherman. Chase Sherman, I thought, had this one, but uh, Parker Porter just showed up and put it on him. And it was a tough fight, and I think he had Chase on the back foot the whole third round almost. We've and we've talked about this before. I'm really enjoying how much more, how many more heavyweight fights we're seeing go the distance or last longer i feel like they're really working classic the you know classic mma you're used to kind of just these lunging brawls from heavyweights and it's like well it's one minute long and then someone's gonna get hit with the punch that's gonna put them down and that's just really not the case anymore i mean lewis and gone showed us that um you know so i mean even built up his cardio after the steep bay loss for sure. I mean, even Stipe and DC showed us yep. how long, how long heavyweight fights can go. But it's so, trickling down the rankings now. And I we've just talked think, about this before. It's just a greater athleticism. Yeah, I mean, you just have you you can't be just okay or good anymore. You can't just be proficient at one thing. You I was have going to, to just be well rounded. I was going to say, like when you hear MMA mixed martial arts, theoretically, you That's know the these point. people yeah. are varied in discipline. But I think in the early days of MMA, we saw a lot more one-dimensional fighters, and that just isn't cutting it because you and I have talked about this before. Mm -hmm. MMA is evolving. When MMA start, you know, when MMA was birthed, most of these athletes had already trained in one discipline. Yeah. You know, you had someone who their base was in karate or their base was in wrestling, but now you've got kids who train you know quote-unquote mma they go to they go to class at an mma gym and they're learning to mix disciplines yes and that's making more like you're saying well-rounded dynamic fighters yep and it's just like we said you, you can't be necessarily damian maya anymore you can't be a specialist of something necessarily <laughs> in survivor rising the rankings enough to make a name for yourself if you can't mix it up yeah. then so it'll be interesting how the game evolves. Obviously, we've seen the calf kicks come into play recently, and Oof. before that, it was elbows, and then obviously jujitsu was a big component in a lot of guys. Games. I was gonna say, I feel like wrestling, wrestling too, is yes. becoming a big point. I feel like every time, every time we're seeing these grinding decisions, the people who suffer these unfortunate losses are people who don't have takedown defense. Yeah, they just get controlled, and then. Yeah, that it's. I mean, it's hard when you like, can't get just, up. It's it's you know. It just keeps coming up over and over and over again. Like you're saying, if you can't get up, how can you want to fight? It's like DC says too. It's you know you, when, you take a guy down, maybe he gets up the first time and the second time, but the third time he gets up a little slower. The fourth time he accepts the position, and once you accept the position, it's over. You can't accept being at the bottom, and that's what we were talking about before with Roy McDonald. He just accepted the position, and at that point, it, it was basically over. If you don't make the attempt to get back up, yeah, you seem to you basically give up, and then the other guy obviously at that point it, it's over, and he knows he's he's got you. So yeah, it's a, it's totally a grind, and you you have to stay in there. Yep. So so and that was another part of the next fight. Mark Madsen grinding out a decision over Clay Guida. He uses wrestling. He's an Olympic wrestler, silver medalist, I believe. I don't know if it was one or two medals, but. He was a very, very nice well-known fight. wrestler, and it was a good fight. Clay Guida's also no got chump. a grinding game <laughs> yeah. and swings hard. And so it was interesting to see somebody transitioning for, to this sport as an Olympian who didn't have the experience in this 
you know, mixed martial arts environment. And Guida's just a veteran. He has over 50 fights. I was going to say, I think Guida's a nice, you know, kind of this main card fight to really break your wheel, you know, break your wheels in or whatever the phrase is. <laughs> break your shoes in, rotate your wheels, whatever whatever it is that he's doing he, they, they didn't, they, transition. They didn't throw him in the deep end of the pool. They gave him, you know. They, they threw him into the medium end yeah, of the pool. They basically put him in. Yeah, but we're like, you got to start swimming. And Clay, Clay Wood is a guy that's totally game. He doesn't, I don't think he resents his status as, no. you know, sort of a gatekeeper ty- ty- type of figure. He's always happy to put on a good fight. I think he's happy to fight these kinds of guys. Um, it's a lifestyle for him. Yeah. And he's a, he's a Hall of Famer for the UFC. He has a fight in the Hall of Fame. So, obviously, he knows his place in history is cemented at this point. And I think he just likes to fight at this point. And I think it's, it's you know, he, he kind of reminds me of how Nate was in that fight versus Leon Edwards of, like, I want to fight a young guy and I want him to have this experience and then be better kind of yeah. thing. Like we saw, we saw Nate Diaz not knock out Leon Edwards. All he wanted to do was teach him a lesson. Yeah. And so, he did. Yeah. And I think that that's kind of what Clay does to people too. Yeah. He's, he's teaching them a little bit of a lesson out there sometimes, you know, like you said, like he'll crack you with a big shot. And you're like, Ooh, I can't take this guy, you know, lightly or I have to be aware of something. Like, that's that, a part of my that, game. That little ponytail's coming at you. You better watch out. Yeah. And he comes fast, <laughs> and it's just – it's a aggressive attack usually. It's always – he's he's a fun fight to watch. Yeah. And then that brings us to the main event, which was somehow an exciting and boring fight at the same time. In a Jared way. Cannonier versus Kelvin Castellum. Yeah, it was – so the, the way you described it uh, when we were watching it, I think, was really good, which was like there was a lot of exciting bursts that led nowhere. Yeah. So it was these flashes of, you know, kind of bang, bang, bang. They're trading shots, and then – no one capitalizes. Uh, Cannoneer handily won the decision, though, in my opinion. He looked like the stronger fighter. His um, combinations were cleaner. I think he was hitting Kelvin a little harder mm-hmm. um, than Kelvin was hitting him. And you know what, though? I feel bad for Kelvin Gastelum. I feel bad for him on one level, and then I don't feel bad on him for, on a different level. But I feel bad on him for one level because he's now 1-5 in, in his last six. Oops. But he's fought killers. You know, yeah. starting with starting with fighting Izzy for that interim title all the way to now. That was a lot of mileage. On he's him. he's been in a ton of wars. He's you know he's fighting everyone in the top of the division, and every loss keeps him slipping. And you know we'll have to see where that goes. But in the that, that backtracking, why I don't feel bad for him is he's got to learn how to get his weight under control. Yeah, he does. Like, that is disciplined. his problem. He needs to be disciplined. If he was disciplined, he could fight at 170. And a healthy, on-point Kelvin Gastelum at 170, I think, would compete very well in that division. Yep. He would be extremely strong. His wrestling would be formidable. I'd love to see him fight Kamaru. But yeah. we can't count on him right on that no. right now. He's and eating way too much rice. We talked about the sad thing <laughs> is that, you know, obviously the apex is there for them and it's free. And all you have to do is move to Vegas and... It's, everything's free. You don't have to pay for training camp. They have all the equipment there for you. They have all kinds of nutrition. Which is his big problem in a yep. lot of people's opinions is yep. get his nutrition on point. I mean, think about it. All like he, he looks overweight in the cage, and you can tell that he's not performing his fastest. Imagine if he shed that extra weight, how good his cardio would be. We've already talked about how he can stay in these wars, and he's got this great chin. Yep. If he could get his weight under control, I think that – he would be a much more legitimate contender and than power also he is would, right now. Would be a lot scarier whole weight class down. Oh yeah, for sure. So maybe he'll hear this and uh, yeah, right. Change his ways. It was a good card. It was overall. a good card overall. I liked it. And the highlight obviously was ridiculous. So we we'll check it out. And then we have this coming weekend: Edson Barbosa versus Giga Chikadze is the headliner. And we're going to start at the bottom of it. Guido Canetti and Mano Martinez. I'm not really familiar with them, but again, that's the first fight on the Well, prelims. we can just kind of skim it and just talk then about the fighters. Pat Ooh, Sabatini Darren Stewart. and Jamal Emmers. Featherweight fight. A women's flyweight between J.J. Aldrich and Vanessa Dimup- Dimupoulos. Then we have a light heavyweight fight. Just Dustin Jacoby. A good up-and-comer to watch against Darren Stewart. That should be a good one. Middleweight, we have Sam Alvey, veteran, against Wellington. Wow, I love that. Terman. <laughs> My boy, Abdul Razak Al-Hassan, is fighting Antonio Braganeto. 
and that rounds out the prelims. And then we've got Gerald Mearshart coming back against Mahmoud Muradov. So we'll see how Gerald does. He's had a rough up and down the last couple of fights. We've got a middleweight fight with Andrew Petrovsky against Michael Gilmore. Kevin Lee found an opponent, short notice replacement. Daniel Rodriguez used to train with Cerrone. He just beat Mike Perry. So that should be an interesting test for Kevin Lee at, at welterweight. And he doesn't miss out on this fight because he was potentially out of an opponent. So then we have the Bantamweight women, Ricky Turcios and Brady, yeah, Brady Heiston. And then the co main you have middleweight Brian Battle against Gilbert Urbina. And then Edson Barbosa, Giga Chikeji, which should be an absolute firefight. They both have heavy kicks. They're fast. Technique is there. So I think it's a really good test for Giga. And Edson obviously still has it, <laughs> as he's shown in his last couple of fights. Exactly. I so. mean, I don't know a lot of the people on this card, so that means it's probably going to be good. Yeah. Because these are the unknowns. They're going to be fighting for their jobs and their livelihood and stuff. So we'll to see yep. how that pans out. And it's at the apex, which means small cage. So, yep. Potentially more action. I think that's usually how it goes. The Kevin. Okay, so going ahead in our rundown here, the Kevin Lee fight is not in jeopardy anymore. I said that. Oh. What yeah, I said he found an opponent. I just went through everybody. Oh. Yeah. You were playing a game. Because I didn't. I didn't have anything to say about this card. That's okay. No, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah, but he found an opponent, Daniel Rodriguez. He said. And then you wanted to talk about Kat Zingano. Yeah, I guess so. Like, this is kind of a mini, like, legal segment, Sedway entertainment. So, what's UFC related? Forget so. what the, I think the movie is called Bruised. So, there's a Netflix movie starring Halle Berry called, like I said, I think it's called Bruised, that featured UFC fighters. And per the producers, for those fight scenes, kind of stunt people, they wanted to hire only legitimate, rostered, UFC fighters and they approached Kat Singanu about being in the movie and they were negotiating the contract and kind of working on it, finalizing it when Dana White offered her a contract that she, or yeah, offered her a fight that she ultimately refused because the fight would have interfered with the movie schedule. Right. And she was subsequently dropped from the (laughs) UFC. And when she was dropped, uh-huh. She was dropped from the movie also because, as I mentioned before, they only wanted to hire active rostered UFC fighters. And so she is suing the UFC um, for jeopardizing that opportunity for her. And I don't know. It's kind of a toss up for her case based on the law that I know. Um, it's honestly it's going to depend on how the judge sees it because she may she may or may not have a claim. Without getting too far into legal things, she may or may not have a claim. Yeah. And it's going to be interesting to see how that works out. And honestly, I don't even know if we will because I'm sure that Dana will settle with her somehow. Yep. So, then we had, this is not exactly what we're going to talk about. This piece of news kind of sparked a conversation for us that we're going to go into more. Um, Sean O'Malley on, I don't know, I guess on his Twitch probably, he had he flew in two guys who one is just a guy that's been a Twitch subscriber and one is an amateur, I guess, MMA fighter. He's got a couple stripes on his white belt. I mean, there's a huge weight difference between the two guys. So there's a big guy who's not a fighter and a smaller guy who is a fighter. And so this kind of, for me, reminded me of UFC 1 where, or, you know, it's Hoist Gracie coming in, smaller guy, jiu-jitsu, against just it's bigger, like untrained, just brawlers. A David versus Goliath kind of manufactured fight. Yeah, and so... But I, I obviously, you know, just a lot of the time when you watch MMA, you look at it and you're like, well, you know, the bigger, stronger guy should win. And that's how people have looked at it historically as well. But obviously sometimes it's not the case. We you know, know that that's not necessarily the yeah. case. So it's just interesting. I don't know. How much do you think that people have overcome that predilection? And how much do you think people I mean, realize the technique is really I think, important? I think I mean, we've really Izzy showed that against Costa. sort of so sort of in when we we're talking about you know uh, we were talking before about just 
the evolution of fighters. I think there's a way there's a way broad, way broader range of body types in certain divisions because really people have really figured out how to exploit their weight right. to height ratio. Um, you know, some people are fighting toward the top of their body, their body weight. Some people are cutting ridiculously. Well, and it also depends on obviously the gaps between the weight classes because we know that 185 down to 170 is 15 pounds, but 185 right. up to 205 is a pretty, is a bigger jump. It's a way bigger jump. And 145 to 155 is only 10 pounds. But and we're also seeing like there's a lot of divisions that have a you know a huge height disparity. Yes. Between some of their stars, Feather I mean, weight, think, I think about think one. about when DC was fighting and Stipe was what, almost a foot taller than him. I, I like to think Max Holloway. Max Holloway Volkanovsky. very skinny and tall. Sean O'Malley very skinny and tall. Yep. Gasolum very Connors, short and stocky. And tall, a little bit stocky, but Mendez was short. Bulk. The fact that you could look at somebody like Alexander Volkanovsky and then you've got Max Holloway and they fight in the same division can be a little bit startling when yeah. you see them next to each other. And that's happening more and more. I mean, even think about when uh, Megan Anderson was on the roster and she's like 6'1". Yeah. And at 145 yep. and she's fighting, you know... Someone that's five two and you know at one forty five. It's they're just some really uh, big discrepancy. I think I think the mismatch fight is just a part of MMA, and I think that the style that you use can really help you there. Because like you said, like if you're if you're Kelvin Gastelum and you're trying to fight Izzy, who's a very long person, that involved kind of baiting Izzy into the pocket and taking yep. hard shots. You know, like yeah, we we've just we've seen it time and time again. Yeah, it's true. It's literally Although, it's literally biblical. Sometimes it does matter <laughs> though, even when there is equal technique, as we saw, like you said, with Jan and Izzy, that was technique won out as well as size because size helped the technique be better. For sure, yeah. So interesting stuff. And then we have prospective title fight for Rose Namajunas. They've been talking about Wei Lei. Zhang, or they've been talking about Carla Esparza. Esparza obviously has history with Rose. So, yeah, I wanted to kind of talk about the pros and cons. And I think one reason that Rose versus Carla is easy to market is because it's a it's a rematch. And, yeah. and everyone loves a good rematch. It's a rematch for a long time coming, I believe. It's I mean, a, that was a long time ago. A she tough still had rematch, hair. right? Yeah, she still had hair back then. <laughs> yes, she still had hair. Um, and I think, is anyone excited about it? No. Would people watch it? Yeah. The point is, from I guess the con, the cons point is that it would not attract a lot of viewership. It would have to be underneath a really strong main event, I think, um, because that's not a fight that's going to bring in money. And I think that that's what makes Dana reluctant to book it. Yeah. So Dana's all about the money, and especially also- because, like you were saying before. Weile, um is one of the keys to the Chinese market. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't really know where they would have the fight. Um, but yes, it's going to be big, and that's going to be an interesting factor to look at. And it was a beautiful knockout against Weile, but Weile was also a dominant champion and took the belt pretty convincingly, too. So and she what, she didn't get outclassed in that fight either. She just got caught by a really nice head kick. So, so I think people would like to see it run back as well. Yeah, because we expected that to be a war, and then it was over so quickly. So... I think people would like to see that run back, and I don't know if people want to watch the grinding. Carlos Sparza, potentially not as good of a standing game against Rose, and you know, may just be, be delaying the inevitable. And at that point, you may lose that fight if Rose or Weile somehow have something happen. So, I think Dana will take that follow the route, money, but we'll see. And then we had a conversation about, I guess, like the mentality of fighters. This was something that I found really interesting, and I think we kind of. Figured out a way to articulate it better, but there's guys that go in there, and I, I guess we figured out we we split into two different sections of the fight, right? The pre-fight and then the so fight pre-fight, itself. Yeah, your pre-fight preparations and your mentality are there, and then your mentality, I guess, on fight night and in, in the, the o- yeah in the octagon. And so we were kind of talking about this with the Rory thing, where he had the mentality of I'm going to go in cl- clear-minded. I want to be tactical. I want to just like be detached from my emotions. I don't want that to take over. And that's how he goes into the pre-fight, and that's how he enters the fight. And I think for me, one of the things that I see that, you know, he is he losing it is the question. But, like, for me, it's – he when he had that intensity, that was different, and that pushed him through things, and that made him come forward, and that was exciting, and that was 
a different type of style and mentality. And so when he decided to shed that, I don't know if the intensity is there. I don't know if it's the same type of thing you need to be at the top of the game. Be at the top of your, yeah. Because Ray Cooper goes in there and he, he's ready to die. He's hungry, yeah. He's ready to die. He, he's, he has the mentality of bite down on the mouthpiece, I'm going to grind you out, and I'm going to beat you down. And it's, you know, the fighter in me is just, this is where we do our business. And I don't think he has to talk during the pre-fight. And I, to me personally, I look to Nate Diaz as one of the most consistent and probably best examples of where you – a consistent can attitude. Be, can be consistently successful, potentially. Because before the fight, I think he's right. Nothing matters. You can say whatever you want. We can go back and forth all day. But at the end of the day, we're going to step in there and we're going to throw hands. And that's where the fight really is. None of the stuff before it matters. That's what matters that night. And so I think he's separated into those two things. And that night, though, he walks in and he's ready. He's ready to throw down. It's a war. He's ready to die. Or even like... And that's it. Kamara Usman, I think, is really good, too. Where, like... Right. It's, it's legitimately all business for him. He has, for the most part, except for Masvidal and a little bit. Well, fight, Kobe, week is, fight week is yeah, business fight, for him. Fight week is business. He he does get you know into the trash talk and the rivalries beforehand, but the fight itself and the preparations, regardless of his personal feelings for his opponent, are clinical, and it's about being his best. And those also, are honestly the most successful fighters. But he also respects his opponent's enough to know that okay look i need to prepare because yeah i I actually need to prepare i need to be ready for my worst possible night and their best possible night and i need to be ready to be better than them if that happens and i think he does the preparation to be there yeah you know like he got rocked by gilbert and he realized like i need to change what i'm doing and he bit down and he was like i gotta work my jab and he worked it out and he listened to his coaches but that's that's what makes great fighters and some people can't do that and we've seen We've seen intensity go off the deep end. You, we, you and I were talking about this before, yep. where the last time Figueredo fought uh, Moreno. Brandon Moreno and he lost his title, he was crazy intense um, in the embeddeds from fight week. I mean, like, not even an exaggeration. Crazy eyes, crazy eyes, crazy I'm comments. Going to rip his head off. Sunglasses going... inside. Yeah, it was like, you know, this is just a professional fight and part right? of it was to the juxtaposition of the first fight was so friendly amicable they respected focus, each other like was yeah focused. respect driven and they went in there and they put on a show and they both brought it and it was a great war but then this time it was just i think figueredo couldn't he couldn't get out of his own head and that that intensity ultimately hurt him and he lost his belt that's how because, that's how yeah. that hurt him and moreno went in calm the exact opposite he went in calm and when figgy calm and confident figgy shoved him at the weigh-ins he just fell back and was laughing. I can, he said after the fight, he's like, at that moment when he put his hands on me, I knew I won the fight. And in that pre-fight, yes, Jade's right. He One guy lost his cool and was already in his own head, and the other guy was living rent-free in the other guy's head <laughs> and was not worried about it. It's like a weird comparison, but it's like in the uh, UFC video game when you're preparing for the fight. Yeah. It's like he peaked too early. Yeah. Like, I think, I think he definitely started in the right emotional place for the rematch. You know, it was hungry. It was like, okay, you know, this kid's back for more, and I'm really going to give it to him this time. You know, it wasn't that close of a fight. That point got taken, blah, blah, blah. And then, like you said, it was just like it consumed him. Yeah. Almost. So, and then another guy we talked about was Gaethje with, I, I think he went into the Khabib fight correctly. It was all respect. Obviously, he was confident. He believed in himself. You have to if you're going to go into this business. You have to think you can beat everybody. But, I mean, that was still a respectable level. And they went in there. And then there was all respect between both of them. Like, obviously, Khabib said he submitted him as opposed to knocking him out because he respected him, didn't want him to His suffer any to see that. unnecessary pain or, you know, punishment from getting beaten down. And so, you know, the juxtaposition of that between now Gaethje and Poirier where I just don't like your face. And he seems like he's just, like, irritated. And he's letting this get to him. And he just... He's manufacturing something to get ready. And yeah. The, and then the pre-fight. Like trying to spark some emotion. Right. And in the pre-fight, I don't think that's the right place. Obviously, he talked about also in, in the fight, right before the fight, he has to tell himself, look, like I'm going in there and one of us is going to die. Like he's trying to kill me. I'm trying to kill him. And that's how he gets himself in a place where he can run on adrenaline and run on muscle memory and just be in there and. Tell himself, I'm not going to go down. The other person is going to go down. And then I think in the cage, that's okay. 
But when you're outside, like you said, if you peak too early with that emotional rush and that adrenaline and that that whatever dump that you have, then you're you don't have it on the day of the fight, and you're yeah. not going to you, be able to manufacture it again. You're spent in a yeah. way. I mean, think think about it. Like people people who have emotional spikes like that, you're always exhausted after. You know, like how many times have you heard someone who's like, "Yeah, I spent all day crying and sleeping," like, <laughs> you know, it, that kind of output requires recovery, and it's like you're saying, if you put it out too early, you've already mentally gassed yourself, just like you know, physically gassing yourself in the first round is bad. Yep. Mentally gassing yourself before weigh-ins is also really bad. Yep. <clears throat> so, so that was, I don't know, that was just something I thought about. And I thought it was interesting just A, to get it kind of squared out or squared down to like, you know, A and B is A being the lead up to the fight and then B being the fight itself for those two distinct kind of points in time or periods of time. And then just the different types of mentalities you can carry in there. And so that was something that I just thought was worth talking about. And I don't know if you had any other thoughts on that. I think that's it. Okay. And then we had basically, that was mostly, I mean, that was all MMA. And then we have moving to miscellaneous things, kind of boxing, um, having to do with MMA because of who's doing the boxing. We have Tito Ortiz, Anderson Silva, which got Both announced. Getting in the mix there. And then we have Oscar De La Hoya as and, the main um, card. Yeah. I was going to say it's on the same night. Yes, as the De La Hoya and Vitor Belfort, which I hope they are both just absolute juice to the gills, and we get TRT, T, uh, yeah, TRT Belfort, because if you Google Vitor Belfort and Google what he looked like when he was taking or doing TRT, the testosterone replacement therapy, and when you look at him now, more recently in the UFC, there's a huge difference in him being a huge difference in terms of his muscles. I'm still, I'm still excited though. Um. Anderson looked really good in his yes, first boxing he fight. He looked natural. I think that boxing is a sport that he has a real chance to at least have some small-time success in as I mean, a second His fighting foray. style, I think his fighting style fits the sport too. I think, yeah. you know, it transitions and well. I think most importantly is that he looks like he's having a good time. Yeah, he's having a great time. You it's know? fine. And I wouldn't mind him smacking Tito Ortiz around, so. He's not fighting Tito Ortiz. Oh, no, he is. Yes. Sorry. So. That'll be a fun one. I don't know what weight they're fighting at, but uh, yeah, that'll be an interesting card, and we'll see how it fills out. And you know, on that same topic of MMA, I guess fighters becoming more pop culture relevant, and the sport itself becoming more relevant. We have it's more mainstream. Yeah, we have that mainstream feeling of it now, and I think we've both kind of felt that recently. Well, yeah, we with... watch UFC. Well, this morning we watched UFC or we watched uh, Sports Center and. That that's the Bob highlight. Mondes highlight was number two on the top ten. Yeah. So, and now when they're you know on Sports Center, they they run back through the PFL cards and the and the uh, UFC cards sometimes. You know they give the highlights after the weekend, and I mean honestly, I think ESPN deserves some credit for that. ESPN's yep. the most mainstream sports network. As much as I like to hate on them, I think for the general audience not necessarily casuals but just the mainstream audience of mma for the sport in it where it is right now in its growth i think that they've hit just at the right time i mean obviously i've been interested in the sport for a lot longer so i mean i we would both have a little more knowledge than most fans maybe but i mean the mainstream is here. I mean, this is I mean, what it is. Think, it's all over ESPN. It's they yeah. got the PFL. They have UFC. I just and think, it's got and there's highlights. so many. There's been so many more free cards. Yeah. On ESPN lately, it's especially you're right. especially on nights where there's not other things on. I think it's really just made the sport more accessible. People didn't people didn't know where to find even find MMA before really. Right. And I it, mean, it wasn't on anywhere except for pay per views and. Smaller promotions don't come on TV at all. Yep. And and I think another thing ESPN deserves credit for, too, that they've done well, is that they mix their broadcasts very well. They have people that are fighters, current or former, and they have the established ESPN talking heads in there, too. So you'll have... KB. Hannah, yeah. Yeah. KB in there with Bilal Muhammad, or in there with DC, or in there with Alan, Alan Jobin. Jobin. Or in there with, you know, some other UFC fighter. Chiesa. Chiesa Angela Hill. There. Angela Hill. But they can um, give insight on the fighting aspect. Rashad, Rashad Evans. And then the ESPN person can really lead the conversation or steer it 
the way the producers want. And and it, and it gives everybody a chance to grow. It gives everybody a chance to grow. I think it keeps the veteran, not the veterans, but the the older fans interested, especially because, like you said, sometimes it's older fighters. Like, Javon really doesn't fight anymore. But it's, it's an honestly really nice to see him show up on ESPN and give his takes. And it's really nice when these fighters that maybe aren't so far up in the rankings in their division – get more of a chance to be on TV. It's yep. just... I mean, like, honestly, like, watching Adrian Yanez and having, knowing that he's going to get a lot of eyes on him from that is really cool. And, you know, knowing these young guys, these hungry fighters, and even some of the more established guys, like, once we moved to ESPN, I think Donald Cerrone became way more popular. Yeah. I think, you know, some of these, like, Derek Lewis picked up a lot of mainstream hype. And so, yeah, I think it does everybody well. Obviously, we would... There's another discussion to be had about the UFC model of in terms of business and pay and benefits but you know that's all for a different it's day a conversation for another day but as as a as a broadcast company for promotion purposes i got to give dana and espn some credit there for just you know doing this a really good way and having everything really be accessible be informationally explanatory to people so that they can understand what they're seeing because a lot of the time before it's we talked about this with somebody else about um you know we were talking about some i don't understand hockey that much we don't know hockey we were talking about you know Somebody I had talked to previously had a lot of hockey knowledge but couldn't communicate it to me, whereas this other person who maybe hadn't played before but loved the sport, watched it, analyzed it, had a better way of communicating it to me. And so I've recently come to understand the sport a lot better. And I think that getting those fighters in there really does that for an audience that, you know, a lot of the time we criticize the audiences for booing because they don't they know what's give, going on. They can give the technical analysis. I mean, it's really nice. Like, I, I actually thought it was – it lined up so perfectly last night. Um, Paul Felder was explaining the way that Jared Cannonier moves around the cage and yes. exactly what he was describing. Jared Cannonier did it just as he was saying it. He was talking about how he backs up into the cage a little bit and then circles off. And it was really, I think. So he never backs up in a straight yeah, line and he kept going just, diagonal. It was yeah. really illustrative, I think, for people who may not have been able to catch that on their own. Right. And I mean, it's been my experience, especially as somewhat of a newer fan to MMA. When I first started watching, understanding what I was seeing was a big part in me developing an interest in the sport, especially in stuff like grappling exchanges where the untrained eye doesn't know what they're seeing. When right. they see somebody, you know, just swatting at someone's ankles, they don't know what they're trying to do. Or they see, you know, fighters getting underhooks on the cage and, you're not really sure what the purpose of that is. Or even last night, we we were watching, and obviously, like I've been watching. I I did some you know grappling. I have different knowledge there, and you have different knowledge from what you've picked up. And it was interesting because we were both seeing different things in a grappling exchange where a guy ended up taking the back and choking a guy out. I was watching the body of the guy that was being choked, and I had you know I was keeping an eye on the other fighter's leg lock or leg triangle around his body, the body triangle where he had his legs squeezed around the body to restrict the airflow. And I was watching what the fighter that was getting choked was doing with his hands. And you were watching the arm underneath the chin, I believe, or you were watching, watching the breathing. breathing. Yes. Yeah, so. I was watching his breathing because he was being choked. I wasn't initially watching his breathing like you. I act well, actually a little bit unlike you. I was watching his hips and I was right. watching his hands. You're seeing how he was going to try see, and move. Yeah. If he was going to try bridge and, or turn and out of bridge it. or turn out of it. Um, but then about halfway through the choke, I noticed his breathing because he was doing, he was just really controlling his breathing in order to stay calm. He was focusing yeah, a lot. Yeah, he was yeah. focusing a lot on keeping it measured. But kind of like, like a runner's breathing in through his nose, out through his mouth, really giving himself these slow, long breaths while he was fighting the hands. And he got out of it eventually. And that was just, like you said, it was interesting to see. It was interesting that we were focusing on different things. Yeah. And then, obviously, at the end of that fight, he didn't get out of it. And it was just – it was basically just they both were doing the right things, but the person in the position of the choke was just doing it better and overpowered. And he was just in a better position. But that was a great fight to watch. But I thought that that was just something really interesting as well, just, you know, thinking about how can you communicate the information – while it's happening effectively, and I think you said it right, like Paul Felder does it well, and DC does it really well. And Dominic Cruz too is yeah, very clear. True, they're concise, they're clear, and then they communicate, you know, high level technique in a way that people can understand it very easily. So and just telling you what you should be looking at. 
I mean, think they, there's people that watch all kinds of sports. When we were watching the Olympics and there were sports we didn't know, it was really helpful, you know, to have the gymnastics, uh, you know, announcers say before it starts, like, her main goal here is going to be to keep her feet together because that's what she's been messing up on. So when we know we're watching the girl doing vault when she gets up to the top of that jump, we're looking to see if her feet are together. Yeah. We're looking to see if she landed on the line on the mat because we were told those things to look for. Yep. And I think especially Dominic Cruz is good at telling us what he thinks the fighter should be doing next, which lets you know what you should be looking for. Fighters, you know, up against the cage, he's saying if he could, you know, get that other arm under and maybe – you know, set up a trip, we could see a different fight outcome. So then me as a viewer, I'm starting to look at the hands. I'm starting to see, you know, can he get his leg around? Can he turn this? And it's orienting is what it is. Yeah. So props to them. Good on the announcers as well. And another thing they've been doing well too with the UFC, this is more, I guess, Dana international presence. They've been really ramping up their presence in other countries and trying to get really the markets open. And like we said, China, Russia, France, Mexico, these are all markets that Dana's really trying to tap into. And the fighters are honestly really helping to open up. Yes, and exactly. And really cultivate fans in their country because as much as Dana wants different places to be markets, you can only be markets if there are fans there. But at the same time, too, I think that the UFC with the ESPN deal has stepped up a lot of the promotional material, too, though. Yes. Like showing the, hum the personal side of Brandon Moreno – Allows people to see his culture, but also see who he is as a person. Yeah. And you kind of you get to know the fighter better than just like and the guy on the card, you know, or you see it on the billboard or whatever. It's like we were talking about earlier. We're seeing more fighters that keep to their roots, like like you said, like Ray Ray Cooper. Just he fights still. He trains in his garage, or yep. like Brandon Moreno was the first actual like Mexican born champion like we have a we have a ton of mexican american like fighters champion. yeah she was first chinese and champion. she won it in china it was yeah. crazy so and that's obviously what they want to do with russia and france here right so you know so yeah so it's been interesting and i and i think like you said brandon Moreno is the first mexican born champion and that's and that's huge because you could have a mexican american champion henry cejudo but it's not the same yeah and and it's the, the difference between like you know, Connor for the Irish, and obviously not all of them like him necessarily, but it's like that, like actual Irish or, you know, Henry Sudo, like you said, Mexican American versus Brandon Moreno, Mexican champion. Like it's different. And, and like Aldo still trains in Mexico, like you yeah, talked exactly. about with, with Aldo. You can go ahead and yeah, no, that. say the comp to Aldo of like he's born, raised in Rio. He's born and raised in Brazil. He represents Brazil. He's the king of Rio. And he fought for, you know, for a while and he was dominant. And he didn't leave where he was from. He didn't go to ATT like a lot of these guys do. He didn't go to a big gym or he didn't jump around. He like, like you said, Ray Cooper. He stuck with the gym and he did what he needed to do and he and he's, represented. He's still doing it. Yeah, and so at a high level, and so that's just you know. And that just it just rate it honestly just it's a domino like drop in the water like yes. you know drop in the bucket effect of and, you know you say you say where you're from. Your gym gets more hype, yep. more people join it. That like ultimately that leads to your more. Country, yeah. yeah, it's building a sport in your country. You start exporting yeah. more fighters. Like we've seen after Wei we've seen a lot of the presence in China ramp up, and like with Gan and Ngannou, France has built a bigger foundation for MMA, and they legalized I think MMA recently. Um, yeah, Russia and, obviously Khabib was a trailblazer for them, but they've got now, like you said, all he's the Khabib funneling. Clones. Yeah, he's funneling a lot of talent <laughs> you know. in from his Eagle FC. So it, it's interesting. And I'm really going to be excited to see who they decide to put where and if where they decide to have fights because I know we're going to get some more Abu Dhabi fights. Um, but, yeah, we'll see if they want to do Mexico or Russia or something like that. So, you know, that will be interesting to watch in the next oh, year one, or two. One final uh, miscellaneous on the main note just because I find it funny. Khabib will be playing pro soccer in Russia. Oh, yeah. I think that's Soccer, his second love. Or may, honestly, it, might, it be might be his, his first, first love. Yeah. Is, <laughs> <laughs> his fighting, I guess, was a detour to his soccer career. But he will be playing pro soccer in Russia. He's really excited about it. And you know what? If he's excited about it, I'm happy for and him. And I may have to copy And it's Khabib like I Jersey. said, I, I love those crossover athletes. Like, I know a lot of people thought it was dumb, but I thought it was pretty cool that Chad Johnson took a boxing fight just because he wanted to see if he could do it. I thought yeah. it was pretty cool that uh, DK Metcalf ran in the track championships just because he wanted to do it. Yep. So more power to people that have the opportunity and take it. So good stuff there. And I think that'll do it for us today. We're running up, I guess, again, about about 55 minutes. <laughs> so 
Shout out to uh, our one for sure listener. He's been a real one. <laughs> and uh, to any future listeners, hope you enjoyed. Welcome. And we will see you again at some point soon to discuss. I don't even know. We'll, we'll figure it we'll, out. We'll drop something interesting. Yeah. Actually, maybe one of our next podcasts will be the breakdown of our fantasy teams. Oh, it's we'll have true. To see. Or just a quick preview. Well, we did some fantasy stuff. So yeah, maybe after that's true. But well, we, we could go through like between. football week one preview or something like that. Yeah, that's true. All right. So we'll get there. And like I said, we're about just over 55 minutes. And that should do it for us today on pod number nine. Bye.